All right, so this is Meaning of Life TV. Uh, my name is Nikita Petrov, and you're Daniele Bellelli. And last time I checked, I was. So I hope you that's are. Good. You are like a whole bunch of different people, different things. You are a university professor yep. with a very broad range of things that you teach, right? Yep. What are the yep. courses that you do now? Uh, right now, it's not that crazy i'm doing um, native american history mm -hmm. uh u.s history uh history of religions so that's mm -hmm. kind of all over the world those are the main ones i've been doing lately but yeah some of the range of courses i've taught is pretty insane i've taught courses about uh history and philosophy of martial arts uh, i've done like some crazy courses that don't even exist i kind of mm -hmm. made them up all right so Apart from that, you are a podcaster. You have two shows. Yep. One yep. is also kind of all over the place, The Drunken Taoist. Yeah. And then the other is a, like a properly researched history show called History on Fire. Yeah, that one is, the research is heavy. <laughs> it's, I like getting it done, but good God, the amount of work is brutal. It's probably about at least 200 hours of research for an episode. Oh, wow. But it's it's not just education though. Like I've I've listened to a few episodes and you. Many people when when doing something like that, it, they make it dry, and you yeah. kind of add, or rather, you, like you don't remove the human epicness. Uh, from yeah, because that's the fun of it. Otherwise, uh, you know, there's a reason why people tend to always consider oh history. <laughs> I don't want to deal with that because it, it it's true. You know, they turn it into a long list of names and dates that really have no relevance to anybody's life and and there's no human story there so nobody cares rightfully so to me it's not even that hard to do it because the stories are there they are powerful just don't take them out right. and then you're good to go you know there's some great stuff there okay so those two things and then apart from all of that you are a writer and you've written uh -huh. a few books also what some are on philosophy of fighting there's one on religion Yep. Right. And then this, I just finished this a couple of days ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a uh, recent one. I'm not afraid. Yeah. Yes. On fear, heartbreak, raising the baby girl and cage fighting. Um, and this one is very different from everything you've done before, from what I understand, because this is a personal yeah. story. Exactly. Yeah. That's more personal. And because it's personal, it's more narrative because you're telling actual things that have happened and so on. So it's, uh, it reads in a more narrative fashion. And, um, yeah, cause I mean, I think when, when you talk about philosophy or when you talk about things like that, some people are interested, some people are not. When you talk about, when you bring a personal story in, when there are characters you can relate to, you know, real life character in this case, but people that uh, it's so much easier for people to relate, to be interested, to care for it's so much easier for some of the same thing that you can say in more abstract formats that nobody likes. Uh, when you say them in this fashion, people get into it, you know? So I I noticed doing podcasts with Duncan Trussell, like whenever we would talk more philosophically versus whenever we would talk more from a personal basis, people responded so much more when it was personal. That makes sense. You have you have said, though, and I think you, you said it in the book, that you kind of struggled initially with the idea of sharing your own story. Yeah, mainly because I feel like, you know what, there's nothing that, you, like, it's kind of weird to write about one's own story anytime, because ultimately you think, like, look, ultimately, yeah, there's this that's interesting, there's that that's interesting, but it's not that unique, you know, people go through things, uh, what is this self-important thing that I'm, oh, you need to read my story, it's like, you know, it feels kind of weird, but then I realize that the way you can approach even something that has happened to a lot of people, even something that is not, you know, you are the one who landed on the moon. Okay, well, you are the only one or one of only a few did that. But the way, the things that people relate to, because everybody goes through them in life, if you can present it in a way that strike a chord slightly different, then it's a powerful thing, precisely because other people go through the same things. I was sort of like, I actually bought this book twice. I read no. the half of the book in print, yeah. and then I discovered there is uh, an audio version. Yeah, there's the audio version. Yeah. And, I, and I listened to the rest of the book, and, and the reason I felt, you know, I already had the book, I didn't have to buy it again, but the reason I felt compelled to uh, listen to the audio version too is 
because I was thinking about sort of the same um, question, you know, from the point of view of a reader. Like mm-hmm. when I go to a bookstore, I kind of like if I just see normally if I see a book like that, I have the same question: What is so special about either sure. this person or or his story? Why do I need to read this one? Yep. Yep. And as I was reading the book, I was kind of like that. This dynamic was happening in my head, and at some point, I realized that. To me, it boils down just to the to the notion of the book, the medium, mm-hmm. because um, you know I don't know why it is. Maybe it's implicit in the culture. Maybe it's something that I came up with along the way. But for some reason, with the book, there's this uh, notion that has to be some very special. Like it, mm-hmm. if in a company, like people are sharing stories, and somebody says you have so great such, such great stories, you should write a book. I normally kind of think, no, you shouldn't. This is right. You just have good stories. That's not a good reason. Right, all right. But, so at the same time, I realized that if you tell, if the same person tells the same story, but on a podcast, mm-hmm. it immediately, just automatically, for no apparent reason, jumps towards, you know, this is very special. I'm privy to somebody's authentic life experience and they're, they're sharing it with me. Right. Yeah, I think it's listening to somebody's voice, the kind of dialogue that takes place in a podcast where you do feel like you're in somebody's living room. It makes it more mundane, which at the same time, if somebody gets more real about it, makes it more powerful. So, yeah, it's interesting how the face of media is changing that way. Is it to you when you, you know, write or record a podcast, do you feel like, you know, whatever the message that you have, whether it's, you know, about your your show about history or you can teach history in a college where you might write something about history. Do you feel that the chosen media changes the, the message somehow or, or influences it? Not too much. I mean, it's obviously it's different the way you express yourself, but not tremendously. You know, in, in when you write, yeah, you have to pay attention to every damn word, which clearly when you podcast, you don't. Um, but... The, um, yeah, I think that's the main difference is just how much attention I pay to language in writing, which when I'm speaking, it's just this free flow. So it comes naturally. It's, that's not, it's not a result of an effort I'm making in that moment. It's a, a lifetime of speaking a certain way and it comes out that way. Uh, when writing, you really think about rhythm, you think about style, you think about things that I care about. Some people don't. You know, Some people read books because they want the content. It doesn't really matter how it's written big on style i to me books make a huge difference how it's written makes a big big difference okay so let's talk about the book you know various book um so it has sort of three parts to it yeah and the first one and uh, becomes kind of an overarching metaphor it seems mm-hmm. the first one is about the practice of fighting, you're a mixed martial, one of the things I didn't mention among oh, yeah. the things that you are, <laughs> you're a mixed uh, martial artist, is that how you say it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how did that start and, and, and why did you do that? I think my personality, the way I was raised, I was, uh, my dad in particular was kind of sheltering me. I see it the way he interacts with my daughter and you know, he's super loving, he's super sweet, he's super nice. But of course, part of this is overprotectiveness, not pushing you into things that may be healthy to push people, you know, to challenge themselves. Because, you know, out of love, somebody wants to help you, and so they want to make things easy for you. The problem is that if you make everything easy for somebody, you don't really teach them how to become strong. You turn them into people who feel very loved, and they are very weak. And so it's kind of that tough balance between showing a lot of love and encouraging people to develop their own thing. You know, in that regard, I did not grow up with um, being taught strength, being taught toughness. I grew up learning how to express myself well. I grew up becoming kind of intellectually very driven. I became a little too nerdish in terms of balance. You know, I became too... And so, of course... That doesn't work. You know, I felt that in my personality, I was too skewed one way. I had to balance things out. 
And so the practice of martial arts was one of the things that helped me a lot, where I would, you know, what you put in, amount of training you put in, you see objective results. It is hard, but if you work hard at it, you do see the results. It's a very easy way to gain self-confidence by seeing the progress based on how much work you put in. And also dealing with fear, dealing with stuff that's scary, dealing with stuff that where, you know, where you are, when somebody's trying to knock your head off, that's a scary kind of proposition, you know, that's the, so dealing with that aspect, dealing when things are not easy or comfortable or pleasant, when things are rough and nobody cares how smart you are or how many books you have read, it's just really what you can do when you're there on the mat. That was awesome for me. I mean, it was scary, it was awful in a lot of ways, but it was also great because it taught me a whole different other side to me, you know? So how old were you when you decided to start? Um, I started training martial arts when I was uh, 17. And you, that was like a conscious choice. You thought that you were... Yeah. This, this whole narrative that you just gave was the same narrative back then? Yeah, pretty much. I felt that uh, I felt off. I felt that something was off. You know, I felt uh, unevenly. I was growing up unevenly. You know, some sides of me were like freakishly ahead of anyone else around me, and some sides of me were freakishly behind that everyone else around me. And I'm like, that doesn't. That's creating a schizophrenic personality, or you know, I need to balance it out in some way. It's not. This is not working. And now it's not working for me because I'm lacking some other experience. Even the stuff that I'm supposedly good at, I'm not really as good as I could be because I'm lacking other aspects of life. So even on an intellectual level, I can relate to certain things and I can't put them. You know, when your personality is unbalanced, it shows up in everything you do, even the good stuff you do. So what would be the things that you couldn't relate to in in intellectual I think I didn't have enough of a, I wasn't grounded enough in like a raw reality of uh, just the physicality of the world, uh, being more at home in my body, being more at home in this kind of objective sphere where it's, you know, because words and intellectual stuff, you can always spin them in one way or another it's it, there's never the clear cut you are quote unquote winning or losing a contest the beauty of a physical sport is that you either win or you lose there's no argument there it's pretty clear what the result is so getting schooled in that kind of life where a more less intellectual and more objective reality was great that was great for me I was thinking as I was reading your book because there is a you're using the metaphor of the battle and also mm-hmm. the notion of fear mm-hmm. for a whole wide range of things and sure. it might be because of the the story that you're telling because the first part is about martial arts and then the second is how basically your whole life fell apart right mm-hmm. yep so is that it, is the metaphor of the battle so important because of the nature of the story, or do you just generally apply it like that, and you do see life as kind of a struggle, and uh, you think of it in this? Yeah, I see it uh, more in general. I see that everybody is fighting a battle every single day because uh, we all have insecurities, we all have fears, we all have uh, how we wish things would be, and reality doesn't really cater to our expectations. So a lot of the things we wish they were like, they are not going to happen. So I feel that there is a constant battle between our laziness, our insecurities, our fears, uh, objective reality out there, all the things that are trying to kind of shut door in our faces or bring us down, whether internally or externally. And the other side of us, who instead wants to make them work, you know, wants things to wants us to rise up above some of this crap. And so to me, battle is life you know it's just it's just how it is for everybody including the most mellow sweet housewife in the world she's fighting a battle every day you know it's a different kind of battle that somebody who goes in the cage but it's really not that different ultimately because she'll have to deal with the same dynamics with the same self-doubt with the same sense of hopelessness with the same moments where you see no way out and 
how you get yourself out of there applies to the cage, but it applies to anything in life. I was, this is also kind of one of the recurring thoughts that I had as I was reading the book, the relationship between, here's, here's a good example. There's a, there's a quote from some, you probably know better than I do, uh, from some Japanese swordsman, mm -hmm. uh, who was talking about different paths you can, you can take in life. And there is the path yep. of the warrior. There is, uh, you know, a path of a monk etc. And everybody, he said, should, you know, tender to, tend to their own path. But, mm -hmm. and then the quote is, once you see the path broadly, you see it on all things. Absolutely. Yeah. Miyamoto Musashi, right. There you go. That's and, the, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's true because it's once you learn a certain dynamics, the specifics of the field change, but the basic essence doesn't. You know, there are certain rules of life that apply to everything. It doesn't matter which one is the specific discipline, you know. That's why to me when people, even the stuff that we were talking about earlier, when you said about all the different things I teach or all the different things I'm into, to me it's all part of the same thing. It's life, you know. It's like the basics are the same. I end up having some of the same conversations in every single class I teach. doesn't matter whether I'm teaching about Native American or religions or anything, really, because they are the big themes in life. You know, the specific examples will change, but the th big themes do not. They are the same thing that is in our DNA. It is the same thing that just the nature of existence forces us to face all the time. So to me, that's kind of where it's at. And so does that mean, you know, I was trying to, not trying, the, the book is really relatable, but... I usually, you know, I don't fight. I don't usually mm -hmm. think of life in terms of a battle. Sure. But the, as you say, the, the interplay of different forces is sort mm -hmm. of there at all times. And so do you, for the, do you think the words, you know, battle and, and, and struggle and then the, the main emotion I think that you're dealing with there is fear. Mm -hmm. Do you think those are like specific accurate descriptions of the thing that that you're talking about or is just one of the handles on a on sort of a bigger thing that can be described in in, in many different ways yeah i mean look at something like fear every single person on earth is afraid of something usually of multiple things and the fears can be completely different you know what makes you scared maybe what somebody else has no issue with but they'll have something else going on that really pushes their buttons so you know some people are fear the majority of people have some degree of fear about what other people will think of them how they are going to perceive them nobody likes not to be liked you know so there's that fear of i need to show myself in a certain way otherwise nobody will like me or you know, fear of death, of course, everybody's uh, freaked out by not knowing, you know, per the extinction of your body, of your personal ego. And you know, there are, you know, 10 gazillion fears from social fears to existential fears to all kinds of fears that to one degree or another do limit people's lives. You know, when you are in the clutches of fear, you are inevitably um, affected by it you're inevitably kind of your growth as a human being can get stunted by it so again to me the specific fear well that's just your fear it's the specific fear you deal with but the big theme behind it applies to all of them so in that sense applies to everybody who's alive when deals with those limitations I was wondering if it's also you know I again I don't often think of I think the same dynamic in terms mm -hmm. of fear, but that's probably because, well, here's a question. When you started martial arts, was dealing with fear one of the main goals? Not consciously, but then when I look back now, it's like, yeah, that was pretty obvious that that's one of the things I was doing. I didn't think it at that moment. But then it's kind of like really when you look at people who do martial arts, 99.9% .9 want to be empowered because they, are, they don't feel solid enough where they are at and they want to defeat some kind of fears. They want to make themselves strong. They want to make themselves more, you know, it's kind of a basic archetype that 
the over i mean why spend so much time doing something like that if usually that's a big issue you know the desire for empowerment and desire to squash one's fears is where is that so do you i mean it, it obviously is a practice for you like a psychological mm -hmm. practice apart from the, the physical thing yeah and the physical is also awesome because there's something about just putting a lot of effort into something and sweating like crazy that just makes you feel good. You know, if you can find some way to sweat that's not boring, it's great. You is know? that, do you, uh, would you prescribe fighting to a lot of people as, as a practice? I think so. I think there's something, and I don't mean fighting, you know, you don't have to be stupid and just go have somebody take your head off. And it can be, I'm all for playing smart, you know, it's to me is about if this is your comfort zone, you want to go half an inch past it. You know, you don't want to go 10,000 feet past. That's too much. That's going to crush you. That's not going to help you. You want to just gently stretch it. You don't want to just go all out. So to me, it's like people who spar in the ring and they just throw crazy bombs all the time. That's not going to help you. That's just going to give you brain damage. You know. So, you don't... so how did you end up in mixed martial arts? That doesn't sound like very close to the comfort zone. Well, you know, <laughs> you slowly stretch it over time. Small steps. Like, yes, a little, <laughs> a little more and more. But uh, yeah, and I mean, and that the reality is that scared me. You know, that really scared me. And so I was like, that's an interesting, I like martial arts. I like how it's helping me in some way, and yet there's this level that scares me. Maybe there's something there. Why does it scare me that bad? You know, why? And so trying to play with that and work at just past the comfort zone, but where I could still handle it, where I wasn't completely frozen, where I'm like, I'm, you know, just one inch before I got completely frozen. <laughs> I was, uh, in, in, in the book, you're, when you describe uh, the moments before a fight, yeah, yeah. when you right before stepping into the ring, or when you stepped into the ring, and then you see the guy you have to fight, yep. I I thought it's a little similar. I mean, it might be a stretch, but I was thinking about different practices that people have in life. You know, some yep. meditate, some do yep. psychedelics, some go mm -hmm. to church, and I was thinking like I'm I'm it's very easy to suggest meditation to somebody as a sure. good you know, somebody says yeah. I, I struggle with anxiety, try meditation, my work. Yeah, absolutely. It's not as easy for me. Like I meditate, I also do psychedelics. With I wouldn't go so freely with try DMT might help. Right. Yeah. Partly because there is that that part in, in doing psychedelics as in is in, in if if you sit down to meditate and halfway into you think it's not my thing, you just stand up and leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you took a toke of DMT or yeah. if you stepped into the ring, you're stuck. <laughs> you're kind of stuck there. Yeah. So is yeah. there, but I, I guess I'm getting that. Is there a cautionary part to it? Like if you. <laughs> the thing that, from a martial arts standpoint, one thing that people can do is try a grappling art where you're not getting punched in the head so you don't take damage rather than striking. Start with grappling. Do like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or Judo, which is great for balance. It is great for... You can still get injured, but it's not the same kind of traumatic injury that you get from striking. It's limbs. You know, it sucks. You know, Nobody wants to have their arm broken by mistake, but it's not the same degree of... Uh, and again, that's a bad case. Hopefully it doesn't work that way. You pick mellow partners. You tell them, look, I'm not looking to get in the cage tomorrow. I am just want to, you know... So you talk to people, say, primary goal, I want to walk home in one piece tonight. You know, so then even people who have an ego maybe are like, okay, you know, we'll, we'll have an easy role. We'll play. We'll work technique. We want... And you start that way, just at a minimum basic level, just getting comfortable with it. And then the adrenaline kicks in and you'll push it maybe half an inch more. And and it, I think it's great to get comfortable with people you train so you know exactly how far to push it. You know, I think a lot of the gym injuries happen with people who either have an ego or they push too hard or there are people that I've trained with where nobody gets hurt ever. And it's 
you know, it's a high risk activity. You should be getting hurt. But a lot of the time with some people, when you develop certain dynamics, you know each other, you know exactly how far to push each other without. Now, this is not the recipe, probably, if you want to be, you know, the UFC champion of the world. But for everybody else, is a good recipe in terms of, you know, gently push it, gently expand. Judo or Jiu-Jitsu, great to start. And again, check which kind of school, if it's some hardcore, you know, go, throw the person 500 times hard, you know, that's probably not the school you want to go to. So you want to kind of get a teacher who understands that. You want to see the people there who are on the more mellow side or they can be more mellow. And then we approach them when you step on the mat should be, hey, we're playing here, okay? Let's remember where. And people tend to mellow out. If you don't, it's so easy to see those dynamics spiral out of control where people have an ego and everybody's like, I'm going to crush you, I'm going to crush you. Whereas if you tell each other, you make a couple of jokes, you relax, you make it friendly, people then want to help you. They are not there trying to crush you. It's you push each other, but you're not trying to squash each other. You write about the difference between, I'm not remembering the second term, there's uh, maybe competitive is a term, and then the other is cooperative training. Yeah. 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 So does that relate to different kinds of arts or different yeah. approaches to... Yeah, cooperative training is what you do in most self-defense arts because, uh, you know, the basics of self-defense arts is that you do all the things that are not allowed in sports. So, you know, you go for the eyes, the groin, the, all the targets that are illegal in sport competition because they are too dangerous. They are exactly the ones you want to use in self-defense because it's not a sport. It's not for honor. It's for to survive. But how do you train it without killing each other? The only way to train it safely is in cooperative fashion because, you know, if you spar trying to gouge each other's eyes, somebody's going to go home without eyes. You know, that's not going to work. So you have to train in a way that's spontaneous enough where you build the muscle memory, but it's not so dangerous that you're fully sparring. Now, it's great that training because it teaches you the stuff you would really use. It's bad because you have no resistance. And you don't have the timing, the speed, the adrenaline, all those factors that only sparring can give you. So, you know, all kind of martial arts are approximation of combat. They are not real combat. Even the MMA is not real combat. It's a, it's a heavy approximation, but it's still an approximation. Mm -hmm. So in some way to really become proficient, you need to learn like two or three different modalities. I'm waiting for the Skype to catch up and remove the echo. Okay, I think this is good. Perfect. All right, so this you you as you were talking about the the difference between a real combat and cooperative training, I, I remember the. I wonder if you you'll find this similar. I remember that uh, an interview I read with a Russian Buddhist monk mm -hmm. who was living in Saint Petersburg, and he said there is a um, a, a funny and sort of. Uh, sad at the same time dynamic that you can see when somebody from a country where buddhism is the traditional religion yep. comes to saint petersburg and has to face the, the, a different reality you know you, you you live in thailand and you're a, a buddhist monk you wear a robe people give you rice and you're free to you know train and learn how to be compassionate and how to remove the ego and how to do all of these things and then you come to St. Petersburg and you're wearing the same robe and the people on the subway just don't like the robe and you're gonna you, you end up in a fight right um because people don't instead of respecting you for the great mission that you're you're you know called for they attack you and there's there's some similarity there between monastic practice where you, when you go to a special place, place a monastery to learn how to deal with, with, with life, being, but you go to a special place to do it and you're surrounded by people who are doing the exact same thing. And it's different from when you go to a city where... Of course. So I wonder if, if, I wonder if there's the same kind of dichotomy between cooperative practice and and uh com not competitive i guess but like a more role it's, kind of yeah, experience in, in a wide range of these disciplines absolutely people otherwise get too comfortable in one modality and they can't switch 
So you see some of these guys who think they are deadly guys, but they've never dealt with resistance. The first time they deal with resistance is a very rude awakening. You get guys who are used to sparring. They are tough. They have good technique. But sometimes they don't think of the most obvious targets that you should strike that are right there. They are open and they are easier to get than what they are trying to do. So it's, you know, it really it's like anything else in life. There's no one single path that deliver all the answers. You need to try a few different things together. Okay, so can you tell me about how this practice manifested itself in... So that would be the second and the third parts of the book. So the second part is when you've encountered a whole lot of problems sort of in the same time frame. Sure, yeah, it's like 2010, 2011, my wife got sick, brain tumor, died within six months of uh, the first symptoms. And then on top of that, so then we lost our house and my teaching career started going down the drain, you know, lots of different things. So, and the, the afterwards, that sort of, that's part two, part three is kind of life afterwards, just kind of raising my daughter and trying to rebuild that everything from scratch and figure it out. So that's kind of a, a like the second part, the, the metaphor of a battle is very easily applicable to when you actually yeah. have a fight going on in all of these different, how does raising a baby girl a, a battle? Well, I mean, the real, when you are, because it doesn't really end with the second part, because, you know, the second, okay, you, you just lost your wife, your job sucks, you lost your house, you are in the middle of real deep shit, and you have to figure out a way out. And in the meantime, you have to give a one-year-old girl all the attention that she needs, and at the same time, you need to try to figure out something to do for money, and you need to do, so there's all these enormous amount of stress piled on top of grief piled on top of all these things so in some way that's almost harder you know because the at the second part is just tragic it's horrible but there's then the reality is yeah that was then and now there's every single day afterwards you know it's not that because it's over as in you know somebody's life being over now it gets easy now you need to dig, you know, if there was you just being dumped uh, 10 feet under in a hole, now there's you have to climb your way one millimeter at a time to try to find your way to the light again. So that's that's battle right there, you know, and some of it is battle in the, with one's own stupid limitations, you know, like one thing that I noticed that I really didn't like about myself was because I had all this stress to deal with. A bunch of times when uh, my daughter would do something, that is the normal thing that a kid would do, I would find myself getting really irritated, getting really angry and like raising my voice in a way that, you know, it's okay to kind of be stern with kids at times, but there's a way to do it that's like, I'm doing it only in the measure that I know is going to help her get something and pay attention versus I'm acting out out of frustration and I'm just yelling at you. That's not the same thing, you know? And I did that a lot, way too many times, cases where I just feel myself consumed with anger, consumed with this sense of uh, uh, frustration, and I just want to kind of yell at her or something. And it's just like, there's a kid, what the hell? You know, that's your problem, that's not her problem. And so that to me is battle right there, battle between the very human side where, you know, you are frustrated, you are overwhelmed and you want to lash out. But then the other side, let's say, yeah, but that's some weak ass bullshit. You know, you don't want to be that person. That's, uh, I understand the reasons why they are still, the reasons are good. The result is bad. Don't do it. Well, that's easier said than done. How do I not do it? How do I deal with all these things without letting them overwhelm me? That, that's hard. That's where it's you work at it every day, and you know if you get one inch better every day, that's great, because you're not gonna solve it overnight. You're gonna figure out some of these things slowly, and as long as it's you know three step forward and two backward, as long as the trend is the right way, then you're good, you know. But you got to work at it all the time. And I mean, I'm not. I don't know what exactly you're talking about with like what would you go to do that would trigger yelling? But is it fair to say that 
the same action on her part in a different circumstance might result like in a chuckle from your from you instead but, of a yell. No. But, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. See some days now when I'm, I'm just recently I'm beginning to handle things a lot better than I have, and I feel like man, that's the same thing that she did before. Why is it that now I can react this way and I can actually be reassuring? Yeah, you know, I can make my point of like, hey, don't do that. That's not good. But I can do it in a very reassuring way without freaking her out, without teaching her something, without all the extra drama. You know, and then she responds well, and everybody's happy. It's easy. Why didn't I do it before? <laughs> you know. Do you have well, an answer to that? Uh, well, I think it's. I think a lot of it is um, emotions tend to overwhelm most of us to one degree or another. It's a matter of pressure. You know, if you are not overwhelmed it because your emotions. The ratio between your resistance to certain emotions and the pressure you're under is still a good one. The issue is if we add enough pressure, eventually you'll snap. You know, it's everybody that there's a point. So, so if, if life does add enough pressure past your strength point, then is how do I figure out strategies to either increase my strength or decrease the pressure? You know, and, and that's a work in progress, clearly, because it's, difficult. It's like growing muscles. You don't just start lifting 500 pounds on the first day. It's not going to happen, you know, and it's so slowly you've got to work your way to become better at it. Now there's a parallel here that I see. I'm not sure if you're going to see the same parallel. I'm wondering. Mm -hmm. I, you might even say this is unrelated, but I'm thinking about there is often in a psychedelic trip, especially if it's like a long one or an intense one, uh, you end up, this is commonly reported, people, you, you think about different things and you, you see sort of the emptiness of everything, the, every word seems to be just pointing to another word, mm -hmm. and, and you try to grapple, you try to find the meaning, and meaning seems to be not there. Yep. And then two different reactions can be triggered by that, depending... Mm -hmm. I'm guessing on, on the same kind of how strong you are or how comfortable you are with everything else, how, how much of resource of you know, strength you have. Yep. And out of this meaningless, out of the absurdity of existence that you can see, may rise fear and complete mm -hmm. breakdown. There is, not, there is no meaning anywhere and it's yep. horrible. Or you might smile because... Even though it seems meaningless, you, you see some sort of a beauty or elegance to it. Sure. Yeah. And that seems to be also the nature of humor. Like when the thing does make sense, but kind of also does. Sure. No, I agree. And I think in that regard, there are amounts make a big difference, right? You know, if you take yeah, a yeah. heroic dose of psychedelics, the odds that they may overwhelm you and you go the fear route are considerably higher than if you are microdosing. Right. So it's, um, last night I tried some, um, I have a horrible relationship with edibles, you know, okay. like they don't tend to help me, you know, I can smoke weed with very little effect, like pleasant, mild, nothing dramatic. Anything that goes through my stomach, I either don't feel anything or it knocks me out. There's but, nothing in between. Let, let's clarify for the listeners that edibles is edible marijuana, yeah, which exactly. has a completely different effect than than smoking marijuana. And that's because, do you know why that is? There is some new, a, a different chemical that is produced in your body? I don't know. And I The effect clearly is very different, but... I think, I think I've heard that... Uh, as it goes through your digestive system, you're, it's actually an a, additional sort of chemical that your liver produces. Gotcha. Inter interacting with it. And then that thing has a, a whole different effect. I might, might be wrong about this, but I think this, this is the case. Not sure, but it's pretty dramatic how different it is. You know, it's not even the same substance anymore in some way. It's something else entirely. And it's... Uh, and it was funny, it's like I noticed where I was yesterday was the absolute limit I could handle. And it was a pretty small amount, you know, it wasn't really that much. And I was like just at the edge of this is 
my limit. Any more than that, I would go into the fear panic mode. And uh, this is where, and you know, and, and people build tolerance to certain things. And so you can, you become more comfortable. You can push your zone just a tiny bit further, but it's like anything else. It's everything is subject to pressure and how much pressure makes a huge difference, both related to your strength and related to the objective stimulus coming in, whether it's a substance, whether it's how much weight you're lifting, whether it is how much life this your way. There's that ratio, strength to pressure. So is, is your approach to edibles or other, other kind of drugs also, like are you treating that as some sort of practice or is it a recreational fun thing? Well, I mean, the thing has been... Like at one point when I was trying to figure things out for me in terms of um, uh, hitting some limits in my personality and in my ability to handle grief and my ability to handle some of the anger that came up with it and so on, I did try to go the mushrooms route a little bit. So I tried a little bit of mushrooms and the little was fun and, you know, was fun and games. It was awesome in uh, entertainment factor. It wasn't really therapeutic. Then I did it in a more therapeutic setting and it was way too much. You know, it was way more than I could handle. And it was just the fear and panic to the 10th power. It was just awful, you know, where... A lot of people say that it helps them, that they feel, you know, it helps them deal with anxiety, this and that. It, clearly, that was not the case for me. It was um, way more than I could handle. And so after that, I've been a bit on the not so enthusiastic about trying again. Not because it doesn't work for somebody else, but I feel like the boundary for me, it's, um, I haven't figured out what my limit is. And so it's, I do want to, you know, and I did once with Teddy Balls, which was awful because I did way too much. So I've had, you know, anything that goes through my stomach seems to have happened way too many times to have really bad experiences. So, whereas smoking never really bothered me. But so what was the uh, rationale or the reasoning for you? you for doing talking about, yeah, yesterday experience. Why did you, why do you do it? I think there's a double element. One that I keep hearing all this research about a sort of micro amounts of THC being actually really healthy for you. I was talking with a guy who was, um, uh, he teaches about the endocannabinoid system in, uh, in, bi in biology courses in college. And uh, he basically views THC like a uh, vitamin. That, you know, you, you don't need to do it in dramatic amounts where it's super, like a mind altering effect it can be minor but he, his belief is that based on his research is actually really healthy for the body and so even without the psychiatric activity yeah yeah so you know yeah. kind of like micro dose a tiny bit where you barely feel anything um that's his thing and so i was curious about that i was curious about also Again, you keep hearing about microdosing being really healthy in other ways, you know, psychologically, something to help you deal with certain issues. So, you know, I'm, I'm interested in that for sure. Um, I think mine hasn't been micro enough, has been too macro and has been too dramatic for me. So that was really not the way for me. Okay. Is there anything else that you, like any part of your life apart from fighting that you would describe as practice? Spiritual um, practice or I, any other term that you use? I think, honestly, all of it is. Because uh, just dealing with the balance of uh, not getting overly obsessed with certain things, how you respond to people, how... You, you know, we are practicing all the time. That's the thing. It's like martial arts is a more formal setting uh, where it's this space with clear rules of how you're going to practice. But in all of life, you're practicing. And... Um, I guess going to the gym and just some stupid lifting weights feels good on a meditative level. I that, definitely. I have a hard time with sitting meditation, but I do feel that certain activities like that are meditative in nature. Um, I think meditation would be great. I seem to really struggle with it, but... Um, struggling, I would like just being restless? or Yeah. Being, uh, I think my brain is too used to going at high speed and resist strongly slowing down. 
And, you know, I'm, that's part of the problem. Like, I feel this kind of pressure all day long to do 10,000 things, and I never have enough time to do all the things that I want to be doing. So the idea of taking time to just sit there is like, oh, God, yeah, yeah, that, I'm sure this is great, but I also want to do this and this and the other thing. It's like, and that defeats the purpose, obviously. The Zen saying, but I think it applies to all kinds of meditation. It says, uh, you should meditate at least 20 minutes a day, unless you don't have enough time, in which yeah. case you should meditate an hour a day. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That, right. To me, that's, that's kind of how I feel like I... I try to meditate daily and then sometimes I sort of fall off the wagon and, and don't meditate for a week or two and I don't have time to do anything. And then the minute I decide to, not the minute, but the day I decide to actually sit down in the morning and meditate, then the rest of the day somehow seems to have more time in it. Hey, that works. That's great. And um, yeah, my discipline in that regard has been awful. I start, I do it for two days, and like, screw this. And then I'm like, I really should do it, and then I don't. So, yeah, bad discipline there. All right. So I wanted to get back also to the uh, topic of podcasting, because, well, I'm, I'm wondering how you feel. But is it a big part of your life now that you started to podcast sure. now? Yeah, definitely. And... You 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 write about it in the book in the in the finishing chapters. Why is it why is it so so um, appealing to you uh, this format of, of media? I think on multiple levels, it's great that the independence of it all. Like you don't need to depend on book publishers, you don't need to depend on uh, radio executive, TV executive. You can just do it on your own. There's no filter between uh, creators and audience. It's right there. There's nothing else in between. And uh, and there, I really dig that aspect. I dig that aspect that is not as formalized, that the rules of the game are not so written in stone, that is very flexible. So you can really be yourself more. You're not just playing a role of what the podcast host is. You get to be yourself. And uh, I like the honesty of it. I like the lack of rules. I enjoy that very much. I was. I recently saw. Uh, I'm trying to, to to find a way to to say it so it's not like offensive. Uh, I saw on uh, I'm Russian. I saw I saw read a lot of Russian media, and I saw on one of the uh, internet websites there was some question about the. Uh, about sex from the point of view of evolution mm -hmm. and one of the people answering said in like opening remarks to the answer said that this comes from the leading expert in the field chris ryan or christopher ryan you know in russian letters in the full name and then there is uh you know the the answer and i felt strange not, I'm not questioning the credentials or the expertise, but seeing Christopher Ryan, who is also a podcaster and who I, I listen to, you know, his show, his appearances on other shows, seeing him being referred to as an expert mm -hmm. felt strange because the usual medium in which I hear his ideas is very much it's just a person talking about things he has to say, things that, that come sure. to his mind. And, you know, since people tend to talk about kind of a wide range of topics on podcasts, you end up, so you might be an expert in one field, but you're not an expert in life. Nobody's an sure. expert in life, a specialist. And so I kind of feel that podcasting just as a medium changes this relationship between, you know, there's, there used to be a specialist for everything. And mm -hmm. I kind of feel now, now this is called into question just by the nature of communication. Sure. Does that, does and, that make sense to you? Yeah, and it's good and bad, right? Because everybody has an opinion, which is good in some way. The fact that you don't need to listen to the expert because sometimes the expert is not really that good anyway. So the fact that the democratization of opinion... And at the same time, everybody has an opinion, including people who are 
horrible dumbasses and they get to put out their opinion just as much as somebody with something meaningful to say. So there's a lot of noise on the internet. There's a lot of stuff that just, you know, you need to dig for the little bit of gold in the middle of a mountain of crap. So both things are true. You know, it's just a different game. It's not necessarily a... I mean, there are things that are better. There are things that are worse. It's just a different game altogether. There is. I wonder if... Do you see... Do you have, like, an idea of how it's going to evolve podcasting and just internet media? No, not really. Um, I'm kind of like... I came to podcasting relatively late. I never even... I didn't even know what a podcast was until 2011. When I ended up on Rogan's show for the first time, I, I, I knew nothing about podcasting. So I'm not really sure. I haven't really heard anybody give uh, good answers about where they see it going. I think I'm just kind of making it up as they go and trying to figure it out. And most of the people who are really good podcasters don't know where it's going or if it's going anywhere or change, you know, who knows. Right. There is a notion, you know, back in the 60s, Marshall McLuhan coined this term global village, mm -hmm. saying that he was talking about television at the time, uh, but he called it electric media that is reshaping the world in the image of a global village. Yep. And in his time, it made, like, the, the point of that, the, the, the meaning behind the phrase is everything becomes instantaneous. We get information from all over the world instantly, yeah. and that's how information travels in a village. Yeah. I want, I, I'm not entirely sure that I understand you know, everything that McLuhan had to say, which I think I, I hear is a common case, but it seems that in his reality with television and then with really a, a lot of internet media too, there is... Like, if you think about a village and how information travels there, there is no broadcasting. There is no TV tower that tells people what is up. Right. In a small community, information travels through rumors, um, mm. idle talk, conversation around the campfire, going uh, to each other places. And I'm wondering if... I, I kind of feel that... Um, we don't have all of these ways for information to travel yet in, in our electric media in the, on the internet. Because we sure. have social media, which is sort of like rumors, mm -hmm. Facebook and Twitter, where there is a lot of information going and it's just people, a lot of it is people just republishing what somebody else said and there is no source. Sure. There is still uh, sort of internet versions of the old media broadcasting, you know, the, there's no difference between a magazine, a print magazine and a magazine yep. online. Yep. And I kind of feel that podcasting is one of the pieces that, that we're lacking, which is a conversation. Like, like you mm -hmm. actually go and sit down and you have a long talk with a person one-on-one -on -one or in a small group. So... I'm not, I'm not sure if I have a question there. Do you, do you, does that sound reasonable to you? Is there? No, and the thing that it's tricky is that it's, um, you know, we are replacing some forms of communications with others, and it's great. You know, internet has clearly changed life in a lot of great ways for people. At the same time, there are things you can replace. You know, the physicality of it all, the sitting down with somebody to have uh, lunch and chatting with them. You cannot really replace it, you know, you, no amount of uh, disembodied communication is going to, because we are not disembodied beings, you know, we have a physicality and we can't, so spending a gazillion hours a day in front of a computer, it may be great in some ways, it clearly isn't in others. And so it's, there's that weird balance that one needs to strike between their physical self and their internet self. And and they don't have to be at war with each other. You know, there are probably ways to combine to get the best of both. But it's very easy to get sucked in and completely forget about another dimension. You use the word disembodied. Mm -hmm. I, there are two things that jumped to my mind when you said that. One is, um, 
One of the recent episodes of Duncan Trussell's show had this guy from Singularity University, and they were talking about how the virtual reality might ch may change the world. I, I haven't really had experience with you know the newest version of Oculus Rift, right? the, yeah. the, the glasses that he put on. But Duncan was sharing a story. He participated in a, a podcast that is held in virtual space. There's some guy whose name I think is Gunter, and there's nobody knows who exactly that. Like, there's no full Sorry. human name to it. It's just an entity that invites people into a virtual space where you actually feel like you're in some sort of a coliseum, Sorry. and there are people sitting on the, uh, you know, in the in the theater, and there are guests in the middle on the stage. And Duncan said he was talking to somebody who looked like a gingerbread man <laughs> and it took him 20 minutes to for his brain to sort of just accept that you know in the beginning right. i am in the, in the virtual space and there's a an image of a gingerbread man yeah. but then 20 minutes in you're actually talking to a gingerbread man right <laughs> right and there is I, I'm kind of freaked out by that. Some people, Duncan is excited about this. He he thinks that we get liberated from our bodily limitations. You know, some some people have we have all sorts of um, issues with with who we physically are, and then the world perceives us as who we physically are. If you're chubby, people don't like you. If you're ugly, people don't like you. I am so freaked out about the idea of being disembodied. If this is where we're going... Well, because it doesn't work, ultimately. Because you still have a body. It doesn't matter how much time you spend in the Oculus Rift, you still have a body. And the, that body does affect the way you will act in the Oculus Rift. If your body is uh, strong, if your body is healthy, it's a very different experience than if your body is not. Your brain is going to function differently. The very same brain that you're going to be using when you are in this disembodied space. So you're never really out of it. You can transcend some limitations, which is great. But the idea that you can be out of it is an illusion. You're never going to be out of it. You know. So to me, it's um, again. To me, it boils down to balance. It boils down. All for technologies that allow us to, you know, if tomorrow we can have this awesome disembodied podcast in the middle of the greatest, whatever the cool place that you want to be in, you are without having to fly, without having to fly 5,000 miles and you get a glimpse of that experience, that's awesome. Why not? But if you think that's all that life is and you forget about the body, if you forget about the face-to-face -face interaction, you forget about all that, that's not, that's not advantageous. You're trading one prison for another. You know? To me, the whole game, doesn't even matter what we're talking about specifically, is about everything is the best of both worlds. Is take the strong side, take the good sides from anything and leave behind the inevitable problems that go with it. A lot of the way you do it is by combining things, right? You know, there's one thing that has some strengths and some weaknesses. You combine it with something else that has very different strengths and very different weaknesses. And that allows you to build on the good stuff, leaving behind at least some of the unpleasant part about it. So to me, if you go have a very physical existence, you do build a healthy, strong body, and then you jump into the Oculus Rift, great. If you only do one or the other, you're missing options out there. Is this a notion of combining the best parts, so it is also a premise of your um, Bill Create Your Religion, is the title of the book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, and that's kind of the base. It's sort of like Bruce Lee ap applied that idea to the martial arts. You know, take different martial arts styles, take the best from each one and create your own thing. To me, the same model can be applied to everything. So in the Creator of Religion book, I'm applying it to religions. You know, consider the big questions that all human beings struggle with. Look at all the different answers that different religions, and for that matter, even different philosophies have provided to those questions. 
figure out what seems healthy, what leads to good results, figure out what does not seem healthy to lead to bad results, get the good stuff, reject the bad, come up with your own answers, figure out, you know, essentially is create your own path in this process. And it's not create from scratch, you create based on looking at what other people have done and what seems to work and what seems to not. I think that's what any self-respecting human being should be doing about everything. You know, you don't just replicate something out of dogma. You figure out what works and what doesn't. And then the way your answers may be different from mine, but as long as we both allow each other our respective answers and we don't try to impose them on each other, and as long as we're not hurting anybody else in the process, great. Just do your thing. So did you end up with... Your podcast is called The Drunken Taoist. I know that you had a course in Taoism. Is, sure. Do you have a tradition or a philosophy or a religion that is more you are more aligned to than others? Is Taoism a sure. one like that? I think I dig Taoist ideas precisely because they leave you very free to you know, whereas most identities are rigid, you know, if you are Christian you can't be Muslim. If you're Muslim you can't be Christian. If you're this you can't be that, you know. A lot of Taoist philosophy, there are many variations of Taoism, but some of the basic Taoist ideas give you the freedom to be anything, essentially, because you are following some universal principles of how life works, rather than some specific doctrine of do this, don't do that. So to me, Taoism is a known identity. It's a, it's a great source of ideas without binding you to a single identity with all of its dogmas and all of its problems. And as such, I have an easier time with it. But I'm not all that attached to the term. You know, it's like if I found a lot of great stuff in Taoism, it resonates to me with the way the world actually is. And so I'll use it. Some Taoist ideas that don't ring with me, I don't need to follow them. They are not. So, so I'm a big fan of taking from whatever source works. Even like in the big, even some religions that I may not appreciate that much because I think they have gone in a really bad direction. Doesn't mean that it's 100% bad. You know, there are a few ideas here and there that I can like in pretty much any religion. There is a lot of crap that I'm not going to like, but there's also, you know, nothing is ever 100% good or bad. It's degrees, you know. It kind of struck me with, I, I've never heard you... Uh, express any um, personal relationship with Islam, but in your in your book with with this overarching metaphor of a battle, yep. it kind of struck me that the idea of jihad, the greater jihad, which is the fight sure. with you know the your own shortcomings and and, and the battle in, inside of your soul, that seems like a very fitting concept. Notion. Yeah, I mean, in that regard, that's why the idea of the greater jihad is an appealing one, because anybody in the world understands that, you know, is the battle against your own limitations. The problem is, overwhelmingly, throughout the history of Islam, most people have not gone that route as being jihad in a more holy war kind of sense, as in squash the infidels, which is what most people are familiar with when talking about jihad. The, the more philosophical, the battle with your own limitations... That's an awesome concept. Nothing wrong with that. That's brilliant. The less philosophical and more holy war against the infidels is a totalitarian perversion, and it's horrible, you know? So it's complicated again. And a lot of things can get perverted like that okay. without it having to be the, the foundation of the... Of the well, and that's the other thing, that people sometimes get lost into figuring out what was the real thing. And the reality is that you're not going to know what was real Islam in 600 AD or what real Christianity was. So since that effort to figure out what the real version is is hopeless, because you're not going to find it for sure, there's so much contradictory evidence, how about you focus on what works now, you know, what seems healthy now? I don't care what uh, Buddha said or Jesus said or so and so said. I care about whatever exists in that tradition that actually would help elevate the quality of human beings now. If that happens to be what that guy said 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago, great. But if it doesn't, it doesn't really matter because it's not about following anybody. It's about improving the quality of life. 
and people get lost in those arguments about that's not really what Buddha said. And how do you, how the hell does anybody know about things that happened 2,600 years ago? The evidence is so contradictory. Are any of the founders of major religions, and ultimately it shouldn't even matter. Because it doesn't matter whether, I mean, none of those guys are going to be 100% right all the time. So take whatever idea works and leave the rest. That clearly is not the way dogmatic thinking works. It's about there's one truth, it's ours. The only truth you can find comes from this source. There's nothing ever wrong into this source. That's how totalitarianism develops, you know. Right, right. So let me sort of wrap this up. I'm wondering if we talked about a practice and we talked about kind of the philosophy, the, the, the theoretical foundations of of a life. Mm -hmm. In religion, there is also a part about community. In a church has sure. served that function as a community. Do you have any relationship like that with some some community, some entity? I think, yeah, the closest thing would be just martial arts classes. <laughs> you know, I have a sense of uh, play. That's a sense of community that you get from kind of like-minded people who are doing there for the same purpose. I really like... I, I don't have it anymore. It was kind of fun to have a place to go to sweat lodges where sweat lodges? American Indian ceremonies, you know, you go, it's kind of like a sauna, but it has a religious component to it. Uh, um, but out here, I don't have any hookups in LA for that. I mean, the places where I've gone, I wasn't that crazy about it. I've had it in, you know, South Dakota or something where if I live there, I would go have sweats with those guys all the time. You know, that would be a cool, uh, ceremonial community environment um, but it's not about just the sweat lodge it's about who goes there and of course that makes a difference and you know who, where I who live who does I, go there say that again who does go there what, what is the community that you ended up with in uh, well in South Dakota was not, like there were it's kind of Lakota ceremony, so some of the people I knew would do it are people I like where I would like to hang out and go and sweat with them in LA, I felt it was a little too... Places I've seen were too new agey. It wasn't really a community that I was interested in being part of. And, you know, good for them. If it works for them, great. It didn't work for me, you know. So that's... I think it's just chemistry with people. You click with some people, you don't click with others. So if those people are all involved in a certain activity, that activity become more interesting, more enjoyable, because that's a community you want to be part of. All right. Let me, let me try to wrap it up with as a generic question as possible. Sure. Um, I, I was thinking about podcasting again in, or not just podcasting, the way, the way the new media functions and, and there, there seems to be more of a dialogue between people and everybody seems to be less of a one kind of a niche, you know, specialist. And I thought it's similar to the way conversation felt when I was like 11 or 12. Mm -hmm. uh, and because life was less structured, there was less roles to play. You're just a kid and you're just dealing with everything. Sure. And nobody was an expert on anything. Everybody was uh, 11 year old doesn't know anything. And so the conversation was built in such a way that everybody brings some sort of a piece of a puzzle, you know, what my father said. And then somebody else says, well, my father said the exact opposite of what your father said. And you try to figure it out. And yep. somewhere in this conversation, after the um, particulars of, you know, school life or this or that, ended, you've covered all the topics, you're left with just life. Yep. So what do you think about just this whole thing? Because nobody had a handle on it. And I kind of yeah. feel like we're getting to that place now as a society where we're realizing that where nobody has a handle on it. 
I think that's where it is. I don't trust experts. I think experts are great because they've spent a lot of time in one field, which is good. It's going to give you some insights, but it also blinds you to some of the connections with knowledge is not a separate field. Knowledge is in an integrated uh-huh. field of many different things. So somebody will dedicate their life to one thing or one thing only. They can help in some way, but they are also limited in others. So to me, that kind of communication, the one that focuses on life, essentially, about what I don't dedicate my life to one field. I want all fields to be dedicated to improving life. That's more what interests me. That's the kind of communication that attracts me more. Um, um, I don't enjoy getting lost into the little super specialized discussions among five experts, which is how the academic world works. And look at what the academic world does. The academic world is a sterile world that hasn't produced the one good idea in the last, I don't even know how long, because it's a bunch of experts talking to each other about their one little field completely separate from life. And most academics, nobody want to listen to them. And for good reasons, because they are boring and because nobody feel any relevance between what they are saying and what other people's life is like. To me, that's where specialism goes wrong. Where specialism goes right is, you know, you want to, you're going to have open heart surgery. You want to have somebody who has done it 10,000 million times, not somebody who, you know, I read poetry and occasionally I practice with, it's like, no, sorry, that's not the way it's going to work, you know. So you do need specialists to some degree, but to some degree being the keyword. When it applies to knowledge at large, not a very specialized technical knowledge, I think over specialization is a disease. So getting back to the so this is not what you like. Getting back to the general kind of a generalized media approach to life, do you have a feeling of, you know, like if, if, I, I, I'm thinking back to these childhood conversations and there was a feeling of, so what do you think about this whole thing? So do you have an answer or like a tentative answer to this whole thing? What gives you life meaning? Is there a meaning to it? Well, that's the thing. I think, some of those discussions lead nowhere because obviously nobody knows. Uh, the best you can get is glimpses that are not communicated in great fashion through words because this is such a intuitive process where obviously you don't rely on solid objective evidence. This is uh, kind of the beginning of Taoism as well, right? The, yeah. The book it's, starts with the rest of the book is not correct basically because... Because right. you can't express it in words. Yeah, words are limited, right? And it's fine, you know, as long as we understand it, that's cool to use them, but there are clear limitations to something that's too subtle to be captured in words. I think when talking about, you know, the meaning of life, any answer is a silly answer because it's based on a lack of evidence. At the same time, to just not acknowledge that you may have feelings about it, some inclinations about it, some that's silly too. So it's, um, yeah, I kind of resist putting it in two specific words, but that, that like, I don't have a super hardcore scientific materialist approach, you know, only what you can see and touch and replicate in a lab is real. I do have feelings about life that are not based on pure science because even pure science is a great tool, but it's a tool and it's limited. And there are some things in life that don't quite fit with our current understanding of science. And so I'm kind of open to the mystery of it all. You know, I understand that life at its roots is more mysterious than any of us can fully comprehend or even partially comprehend. I understand that there's a lot more to the game than what we have discovered and what we currently understand thanks to our science. And uh, kind of leave it at that. Leave it at what can I do in the year and now to improve the quality of life regardless of the big cosmic picture. Because the big cosmic picture ultimately have no power on it either way. You know, I don't... Uh, so as much as it's interesting to put our attention there a little bit at the same time is 
what can I do right here, right now that will make life better for as many people as possible when they step out the door, you know? The, that practical aspect attracts me more. All right, I like that. So there's appreciation of mystery in, mm-hmm. the, in the terms of big questions and then yeah. just what, do you, what can you do right now yeah. to make your and everybody else's life better. Exactly. All right. Let's end it on this. This is a beautiful note to end. Thank you so much. Of course, man. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a great talk, and uh, maybe we'll have it some later time again. Sound good. Excellent. Right. Thanks. You have a Bye-bye. good one. Good night.